Everyone knows the MX-5. It's that fun little roadster that you always promised yourself and so much has been written about it already. But it's hard to overemphasize the impact this car had when it launched. At a time when cars were focusing on more and more horsepower, supercharging to ever more extreme levels, Mazda proved that you don't need an exotic engine to have a lot of fun. Cars already had enough power for public roads where you spent most of your time anyway. It wasn't about miles per gallon, but smiles per gallon. So where did this vision for the MX-5 come from and has it stayed true to that founding vision? This is the Mazda MX-5 story. In the 1970s, small open top roadsters were dropping like flies. The US had impending legislation that would effectively ban them. The 1960s and 70s had been a loud Saturday night party, but the US government was turning on the lights and telling everyone to go home. In this atmosphere, any car company would be mad to invest in a small open top roadster, even if they were produced outside the US as their main market was North America. After all, roadsters seem to be designed for those warm eternal summer days in states like Florida, Arizona and of course California. But the impending legislation didn't stop some from dreaming of a next generation roadster. Bob Hall worked for Motor Trend magazine and in 1979 suggested to Kenichi Yakamoto, Mazda's head of R&D, that they should create their own simple roadster, something like the British used to build in the 1950s and 60s. A car that wasn't focused on power, but on how much fun it was to drive. By 1981, Bob was working for Mazda's US operation and again bumped into Yamamoto, who was by now chairman of Mazda Motors. They reminisced about the conversation and thought a small roadster might be a good idea. The impending US legislation concerning roadsters had gone nowhere other than to scare car makers away from making one. Mazda could tap into a deep public desire for a fun open top, something that reminded them of classic cars of old, but by using modern mechanicals it would be reliable, like how drivers remembered cars of their youth through rose-tinted glasses. Yamamoto thought it was an excellent idea and suggested Bob pursue it further, when he wasn't doing his day job of course. He worked with Mark Jordan and by 1983 the idea became a formal design proposal. Teams in California and Tokyo would produce their ideas for this new car in friendly competition. Although Yamamoto was interested, others in Mazda's management were more skeptical. Only 2,000 cars of this type sold in the US every year. But the Californian team pitched it as a lead-in to the larger and pricier RX-7. The Japanese designers came up with two proposals. The first was front-engined and front-wheel drive, reusing parts from their other small front-wheel drive cars like the 323. Their second proposal was mid-engined with rear-wheel drive, as were many contemporary sports cars. The California team took a different tack though. Like Bob's beloved 1960s roadsters, their car will be front-engined but rear-wheel drive. The California styling was also a little different. Where the Japanese team was designing a car that, like the MR2, was of the moment, the American car's shape harked back to those 1960s roadsters and eschewed modern styling. It wasn't just pretty, but practical too. Car styling was generally refreshed every four to five years. The American team wrote a document titled, Why Not a 10-Year Car? They figured a timeless shape wouldn't need updating as often, which meant the car would be cheaper to produce over its life which not only meant more profit for Mazda, but more reason to approve it. But Mazda's management felt that rather than looking timeless, the Californian design simply looked old. Mazda were going to choose two of these designs to make clay models, and then pick one shape as the final design. It wasn't looking likely that the Californian design would even make it to the clay stage, but the team caught a break. Bob Hall talked about it in 2014. And they had this program where they had these three proposals and they wanted to take it to two. So they showed ours and everybody was like, with ours. And the chief of the guy named Masakatsu Kato, Kato felt sorry for us, so he didn't tell us we lost and he said we can do a clay model. But the intention was our clay model wouldn't be counted. Those two Japanese proposals were hard tops, but the Californian proposal was an open top. 
and we did the presentation and it was shown to the management and they were okay. And then we took the roof off. And the guy who was in charge of the mid-engine car, a guy named Yuichi Sato, who is completely insane, Sato jumps up and says in English, Ugh, build that one. <laughs> the team had gone from also rounds to winning the competition. The next task was creating a running prototype. With the car evoking British roadsters, it was perhaps natural Mazda chose international automotive design in Worthing in the UK to do the work. They were told to make something like a classic British roadster such as the Lotus Elan, but the chassis and powertrain they started with was almost the exact opposite, a 1977 Mazda 323. The front suspension and wheels were taken from the Mazda RX-7 and rear suspension from the Mazda 929. IAD didn't just work on the chassis and exterior, they also mocked up an interior design. This was far from the final car though, Mazda was simply trying to get something to sit in and drive around to understand if a car like this would be successful. Mazda's management came to the UK to compare it against the Fiat X19, Toyota MR2 and Reliant Scimitar and like what they found. Testing moved to California where it was compared to the Mazda RX-7, a Triumph Spitfire and a Strahman Honda CRX Cabriolet. The story goes that someone saw the prototype being driven around, chased it down and asked to buy the car on the spot for any price. With reception like this, it was natural the car got formally approved in January 1986. The US team was still in charge of design, but most development now moved to Japan. The Japanese team used the phrase Jinbai Tai or horse and rider as one. The car needed to fit you like a glove but also be an extension of you. They also decided that like the 1960s sports cars, this new car needed to be simple. The roof would be a basic rag top unless you wanted to install a fixed roof. But soft tops of old were fiddly affairs, sometimes involving tent assembly skills. The MX-5 soft top would be so simple it could be taken up and down from the driver's seat in seconds. But simple didn't mean unsafe. The car had to comply with modern crash legislation and would come with a driver's side airbag. The team knew that they'd be using a small engine, a lighter and more powerful version of the 1.6 litre that would be used in the Mazda 121 and 323, so weight was key. The team found weight savings in the chassis design. Less metal meant less weight to change direction, but also reduced Mazda's monthly steel bill. The look of the car evoked the 1960s Lotus Elan, and so did the chassis, with a simple backbone holding the suspension at both ends. The efficiency of design extended to the cost of replacement parts and repair. When coupled with a relatively small engine, this not only kept the purchase price down, but also the cost to insure it. While the Japanese engineers were about as far removed from Italy, England or Southern California as you could get, they lived and breathed cars and understood the classic handling the car needed. Not only that, with modern suspension design they improved on it, creating a go-kart feel that put a smile on your face. And while they wanted it to be a fun track car, it was going to be driven by people who'd never seen a racetrack, so they made sure it was a car with easy predictable handling. Now Mazda had a final design, they needed five prototypes for further testing. They again turned to IAD in the UK. The team was also called in to do small changes including tuning the exhaust to copy the sound of an MGB after Mazda had listened to over a hundred exhaust recordings to find just the sound they wanted. The new car named the MX-5 would be simple, but being sold in the US it still needed creature comforts. Those baby boomers who remember the 1960s roadsters of their youth were now driving cars with all the latest modern conveniences. All those extras brought weight. Mazda had to skirt a fine line between keeping the car light and making it saleable. To this end, the base model would be paired back, but customers could specify a stereo with CD player, power-assisted steering, ABS, air conditioning, cruise control, electric windows and Lord protectors, and automatic gearbox. Small details like the door handle told you that this was a car unlike any other, something different from the usual mass-produced car. Like many 80s sports cars and the Lotus Elan, the MX-5 would include pop-up headlights. This wasn't what the Californian team wanted though. They wanted fixed ellipsoidal lights, something similar to the first generation Dodge Neon. They were lighter, 
there was less to go wrong and the team thought they looked better than pop-ups. But the Japanese team fought for pop-up headlights. They preferred the look, plus they could reuse the RX-7's mechanism, meaning their limited development budget could be spent in other areas. The MX-5 was unveiled to driving enthusiasts in a research clinic in April 1987. You would think their enthusiastic reception would give Mazda confidence in MX-5 sales. But as it got closer to production, Mazda worried about a car that was only an open top, so asked the California team to design a coupe version. It was duly produced, but there was a problem. When you take a coupe and make it convertible, you end up with a pretty heavy convertible. Yeah. Because you got to cut off the roof right, that carries right. it. When you take a convertible and make a coupe, because you have a tougher body structure, yeah. you come up with a pretty heavy coupe. That heavier car would need a larger engine, adding to the cost. But as the car got closer to production, Mazda's confidence grew and the hard top was dropped although it would be shown as a concept in 1996. The car would be known as the MX-5, but Mazda's US office didn't think the name was quite right. After much searching, they hit upon the word Miata from the old German word for reward. It seemed an appropriate name for a car that was less about a car you bought with your head, but rather something you bought with your heart. Mazda MX-5 or Miata launched the Chicago Auto Show in February 1989 to a rapturous reception. It would also appear in Japan as the Unos Roadster, Unos being Mazda's upscale brand. But Mazda expected sales in North America and they didn't disappoint with long waiting lists that only got longer when motor critics drove one and started singing its praises. Mazda had aimed for this to be a mini Jaguar, and the quality and attention to detail certainly made it a touch above those old 1960s open tops. It couldn't compete with Porsches for outright pace, but it was just as much fun, and customers instantly got it. US sales began in May, and soon Miata mania swept the country, with cars selling for thousands over the sticker price. Sales in Japan and Australia started a few months later. Mazda hadn't expected a great deal of demand in Japan, maybe 250 to 500 cars a month, but the demand was overwhelming, with 3,000 monthly orders. Supply problems got so bad, Mazda ran out of aluminium wheels on the higher-end models and had to steer customers towards the lower-spec cars. Although it came as a manual or an automatic, at launch only a manual was available so there were probably quite a few burning clutches from customers who just had to have this car but had never used a clutch before. European sales began the following year. Mazda had tried British Racing Green as a colour, but it never felt it worked with the black interior. So in 1991, they released 250 special edition British Racing Green MX-5s with a tan interior. It's always the same, isn't it? You wait forever for a roadster to come along and then two turn up at once. This one also used a Mazda chassis, but was very different. Ford had a partnership with Mazda at the time and Ford of Australia conceived a small open top that they felt would sell well in the US market, just as Bob Hall had surmised in the late 70s. Their roadster used a modern Mazda 323 chassis and powertrain, Ford's Italian styling house gear creating the exterior design, with Italian design doing the interior. Production began in 1989, the year the MX-5 appeared, but it would take until 1991 until it appeared on North American roads as the Mercury Capri, and by then people had fallen in love with the Miata. What's more, the attention to detail wasn't as good. By 1994, Ford beat a hasty retreat back to Australia. The MX-5 success made those car companies who'd made sports cars in the 1960s think about bringing them back. So in 1995, Fiat introduced the Barchetta and Rover, ancestor of Triumph and MG, launched the MGF. Both would go on to some success, but globally it was the MX-5 that reigned supreme. Mazda would release a few MX-5 prototypes and special editions, but true to Bob Hall's vision, the car stayed pretty much the same for the next eight to nine years. 
It got a few updates such as dual airbags, better side protection and a larger 1.8 litre engine. An amazing 430,000 first generation cars were produced, but more changes came with the second generation that launched the 1997 Tokyo Motor Show. The MX-5 was always envisioned as a car to get more people to drive an RX-7 and the new body took design elements from Mazda's larger car. The most noticeable change were fixed headlamps, a result of pedestrian safety laws. Despite this, the new MX-5 only scored 1 out of 4 for pedestrian safety in the Euro NCAP tests. Mazda listened to customers by including a defroster in the rear window that was now made of glass instead of plastic. The cockpit remained the same size, meaning the first generation hardtop could still be used on the second generation car. The new changes made it 60 kilograms heavier, like putting a full keg of beer in the passenger seat. Mazda took pains to try to mount heavier parts like the battery and the spare tyre lower to help drivability, and the MX-5 stayed true to its goal of being a barrel of fun to drive, and with a few engine tweaks it remained just as quick. It became the Mazda Roadster in Japan and the MX-5 Miata in North America to bring the name in line with the rest of the world. But whatever it was called, Mazda's little Roadster continued to sell well. But there were signs MX-5 mania was over. Mazda produced 7,510 10th anniversary special edition cars in 1999, but it took that whole 10th year to sell them. A facelift in 2000 bought a stiffer chassis, a small bump in power and other changes such as the option for a 6-speed manual. Just enough to keep the car in the public eye and the MX-5 kept on selling. In 2003, Auto Car Magazine crowned it the best handling car, beating out the Porsche 911. Not bad for a front-engined car. A fun car like this was begging to be thrown around a track, and many owners were doing just that. Mazda showed off the Mono Posto concept in 2000, harking back to single-seaters like the Jaguar D-Type or the Lotus 11, and the 200 horsepower MPS concept in 2001. They were interesting, but it was spec racing that took off just like it had in the 60s with Triumphs battling MGs for Sunday supremacy, and to help drum up more sales of course. The Sports Car Club of America held MX-5 races from 1999 and other amateur and professional series sprung up. In the UK, the Max 5 Racing Championship started racing in 2004. Mazda produced the MX-5 SP performance model with a 6 second 0-60 time, and this paved the way for Mazda Motorsports division Mazda Speed to offer their own turbocharged version in 2004. Mazda wanted to make more changes for the third generation car and previewed them as the Ibuki concept in 2003. Built on the larger RX-8 chassis, the car showcased Mazda's work at weight savings with liberal use of aluminium, magnesium alloy and carbon fibre. The front pillars acted as a roll bar and the rear section lifted up in the event of a rollover. When the third generation MX-5 appeared in 2005, it was clear it was a big update. Some of the Ibuki styling carried forward, especially the front grille and lights, but around the back it was more like the second generation car. Inside it was all new, with steering mounted controls to keep your eyes on the road. The automatic gearbox got the dreaded paddle shifters that were little help until double clutch automatics made them interesting. While the same backbone chassis from the previous generations remained, the suspension was completely different, being borrowed from the RX-8. The 50-50 weight distribution remained as well, something Mazda had been keen to talk about since the MX-5 launched 16 years earlier. It got another bump in weight, despite losing the spare tyre. The keg of beer in the passenger seat from the second generation was accompanied by a baby elephant. That was 170 kilos, or 374 pounds. It got a little longer and wider, meaning it no longer complied with Japanese domestic size restrictions. Thankfully, the engines offered a boost in power, meaning the car still offered the same amount of fun. Zoom, zoom. Zoom. It was living up to the Zoom Zoom tagline Mazda was now using in its commercials. Maybe to make up for the lack of pop-up headlights, Mazda introduced a cool and infinitely more useful electronic toy, a power retractable hardtop. It brought all the advantages of the fixed hardtop, making this a good all-weather car for the first time. 
and the compact mechanism didn't even take up any boot space, but it made the car 36 kilos heavier and that weight sat up high. But after Mazda added a larger front anti-roll bar and tweaked the rear springs, most drivers would be hard pressed to notice any difference from the regular car. The new MX-5 soon had competition from General Motors in the form of the Saturn Sky Pontiac Solstice, Opel GT in Europe, and the Daiyu G2X in Asia. It looked good, but it fell down on the details. The interior felt cheap, a constant GM gripe, the electric window buttons were in an awkward position, you had to get out to fold down the roof, and when you did, the roof swallowed up the tiny boot. And it was heavier. Forget about adding a keg of beer and a baby elephant. GM's cars were a full 215 kilograms heavier than the third generation MX-5. That's the weight of an upright piano. That extra weight meant that the MX-5 was better through the bends. You might drive GM's car to look good, but if you cared about the fun of driving and didn't mind the stiff suspension, you drove the MX-5. Sales were acceptable, but all four GM models fell victim to the Great Recession and GM's bankruptcy. A facelift in 2008 gave the MX-5 a big laughing mouth of a grille, along with front lights and indicator changes, plus small changes down the side, all to give the car a new Mazda family look. Maybe because of all the weight gains, Mazda launched the Superlight concept in 2009. The car was stripped down to the bare bones with an early form of Apple CarPlay, just an iPhone stuck into a slot, and used lighter materials throughout the car. They even removed the windscreen. But there was only so much Mazda could remove, and it still weighed a full 59 kilograms, or a fully grown aardvark, heavier than the first generation MX-5. Many other special editions appeared, including 20th anniversary versions, but Mazda took the unusual step of doing a second facelift of the third generation car in 2012, maybe to boost the flagging sales of this once popular roadster. The changes were small though. The front of the car got another small change, and to improve its pedestrian safety score, which had never been great, Mazda implemented active bonnet technology where in the event of a crash, the bonnet would open, so if the person hit the bonnet, there would be a gap between it and the engine. Brakes were also improved, reducing the chance you'd hit a pedestrian in the first place. Inside, there wasn't much of a change, although by this time the car was offered with Bluetooth and navigation to keep with the times. The MX-5 got the usual raft of special editions, including now a 25th anniversary edition. But sales were dropping. Those baby boomers who'd remembered European roadsters of the 1960s were driving something a little bit more comfortable, and those who had nostalgia for the original MX-5 could still buy an original MX-5. They were plentiful enough, reliable, and unlike European roadsters, hadn't rusted away to nothing. The MX-5 had put on weight over the years, and it had undoubtedly made it a much safer car without affecting the fun factor, which was, after all, the whole point of the car. But for the 2015 fourth generation car, Mazda made weight savings one of their main goals, with the mantra they'd used throughout, less is more. A lighter car allowed Mazda to include a smaller 1.5 litre engine, the smallest they'd ever used, giving excellent fuel efficiency as well as performance. The original MX-5 used a 1.6 litre engine, giving 113 horsepower and 36 miles per British gallon. The new 1.5 litre Sky Active engine produced 129 horsepower while returning 47 miles per gallon. And although the car was a little heavier than the original MX-5, about the weight of four cans of paint, it was still faster to 60 and just as nimble through the bends. It also retained that all-important 50-50 weight balance and the same backbone chassis from the original car. But the first thing customers would notice was the dramatic new shape. Gone was the nostalgic look back to the 1960s, replaced by something more reminiscent of a 2002 BMW Z4. Cars always seemed to get bigger, so it was maybe not a surprise the new MX-5 was wider with a longer wheelbase. Maybe more surprising, it was shorter than any of the previous three generation cars. Inside, Mazda made good use of its parts bin to include the latest technology. Mazda knew customers wanted fun, but also their creature comforts. This was no track day special like the Aerial Atom, but that didn't stop you from having a barrel of laughs on the racetrack. 
texts were automatically read through the new infotainment system. The car featured a lane departure warning system, blind spot detection and backup warning sensors. With climate control and heated seats all in a light car with a powerful fuel efficient engine, it seemed you could have your cake and eat it. One thing that disappeared was the ingenious automatic hardtop. Mazda's new MX-5 only had a manually operating softtop. But in 2016, Mazda launched the MX-5 RF or retractable fastback. The rear buttresses gave the car more of a coupe feel and featured an automatic removable targa section. Not quite the same open air feel, but if you were in the market for a two seater coupe with excellent handling, it was a good option. In 2016, Mazda reached a significant milestone. The MX-5 had sold its millionth car. It had already been crowned the best selling two seater sports car in history back in 2000. Another small update appeared in 2018, giving a little bit more power, plus a few small changes inside. There was another update in 2021 featuring kinematic posture control. That's a lot of fancy words, but to you and me, it just meant better steering response and less body roll in high G corners. The chassis codes for the first four generations of MX-5 were rather logically NA, NB, NC and ND. Mazda entered an agreement with Fiat Chrysler to use the MX-5 chassis for their own roadster, the Fiat 124 Spider and the Bart 124 Spider, which was launched in 2016. The codes for these chassis were NE and NF, meaning any future MX-5 will have to start with NG, if there will be one. Declining sales may mean the latest version of the MX-5 will be the last. As those original MX-5 start to become classic cars, more people who lusted after them in their youth want restored versions of their own to drive. Mazda launched a restoration program in 2017 in Japan for those original Unos Roadsters. As Mazda needed to reproduce some original parts, in 2019 they started offering those parts to North American customers. Most of the work for the original MX-5 was done in Japan. That's where their main engineering staff were. But Mazda was smart enough to go against their own better judgment and listen to the Americans who'd originally proposed the car and were closest to the customers who would ultimately buy it. That paid dividends in creating a car that Mazda's management might not have understood, but millions of people around the world immediately got. And I think that you know, as long as the car keeps those, those key aspects of driver involvement and being enjoyable, it can go on forever. I mean, that, that class of those lightweight sports cars started around 1914, and they're still with us. Now, they aren't like they used to be. They've got brakes on all four wheels. The brakes are hydraulic. They've got real engines in them. But the philosophy behind the car is the same. The MX-5 started as a nostalgic throwback dream. It's the car that's been around so long, it's become a piece of nostalgia itself. And there are plenty of cheap cars around to enjoy some low-cost thrills. But every generation of MX-5 has remained true to the vision of a good value two-seater that puts a smile on your face every time you hit the accelerator. As usual, there's an optional extra video where I talk a little bit more about the MX-5. If you're interested, there's a link on the right. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.